Okay, let's turn our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 26. <clears throat> chapter 26 is a continuation of chapter 25. And so we really need to go back to chapter 25 and, and look at um, Israel prays for the kingdom blessings because that song continues to go on. <clears throat> and he talks about in that day, verse 1, uh, in that day where God will give... Uh, Strength to the city of God. And so he says, in that day, speaking of that day in the future, not Isaiah's day, though salvation was coming for Isaiah in his day from the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and those that have taken them into captivity. But prophetically, speaking of the future, in that day when it happens, and it's usually in the tribulation period that he's speaking about. In that day, they, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. <clears throat> so they're in Israel during the tribulation period when God reunites his people there. Um, they will sing this song. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. And so they're t speaking of a great salvation of God. And our salvation really is pretty awesome when you think about it. When you think about the rebelliousness of man, Adam and Eve, and how they were given a simple commandment to stay away from a fruit, not to eat of it, and yet they rebelled. They couldn't even keep that command. I often hear people say, <clears throat> well, if I was there, I would have kept that command. That's not a difficult command to keep. But yet, God has given us commandments today to keep, and yet we struggle with those commandments, don't we? So if we were there, and we were Adam and Eve, we would probably do the same thing. We'd break that commandment. Now, what's so great about our salvation is that it is the salvation that is brought about by God Himself. That He sent His Son to die on the cross for us. That's the great salvation. It's not based upon our works not based upon our efforts. It's all based upon what God has done on the cross through His Son, Jesus Christ, and we become righteous. I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. They're great verses. They're verses that you should memorize. In fact, you probably have already memorized them, and they're dealing with salvation. In fact, chapter 1, or earlier, a few verses earlier, he talks about the same thing, that our salvation comes by grace through faith. And that is so wonderful that all we need is faith and trust in God that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross was enough, it was sufficient for us. And believing in that, by faith, we have grace in God. And it's not of ourselves, it is a work of God and not of our own, least we should boast. And so it is a great salvation. It's the righteousness that Jesus brought to us, and thus we are righteous in the eyes of God because of Jesus Christ. And there's a song in the heart of every person that is saved, <clears throat> that is truly saved. There's a song in their heart because they have been saved, <clears throat> because they do know the Lord, and because they have this free gift given to them there is rejoicing that takes place in their heart. He goes on and talks about the Lord being the source of our strength here. Verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. So, Peaceful life comes from focusing on Jesus Christ. That's where a peaceful life comes from. It comes from us accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and thus we have peace with who? With God. We might not have peace in the world, but we have peace with God because we are right with God. And so trusting in Him brings that peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart, mind, through Christ Jesus. And so it is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Uh, that peace comes from knowing God. And when you know God and you know the work of God through His Son Jesus Christ, then there is a peace of God in your heart. That no matter what goes on around you, you're at peace with God. You may struggle with the things around us. They may, they may move us emotionally in a negative way, but yet 
there's a sense where we know God. Oftentimes we go through experiences and they're difficult for us to handle in the beginning. But ultimately, when we begin to pray and seek God and really dwell upon how good He is, God seems to take hold of those situations and brings the peace with that to where we're trusting in Him now and we have that peace knowing that He will take care of the situation because God is in control. And it's really trusting in that truth that He is in control. And so many of us don't really believe that. We want to take control. And we want things to happen the way we want them to happen, which shows that we're in control and not God in control. Uh, the church is, um, is a challenge. There's always a struggle within the church. There's always a battle uh, on what to do and what not to do. And, and we need to realize that that struggle is not ours. It is the Lord's struggle in battle. I was thinking about this today as I was reading this verse. I was thinking about some of the struggles that I've heard of uh, in other churches, you know, and then kind of correlated them with my own struggles within this church. And, it, and it, it really stems, these struggles stems from people wanting to control the church of God instead of allowing God to control the situation. I was thinking about Pastor Chuck years ago um, where the board... prayed and thought that the best path to take was to build a bigger sanctuary. And so they, they, they decided that they would kind of bypass Pastor Chuck's thoughts on it and build this bigger sanctuary. Well, it, it caused some, some difficult uh, relationships to happen there. And Chuck had to call in some other guys because the board was pushing their way, pushing their plans, and Chuck didn't want to go that route. And so they had to come in and basically redirect the board in that who was really in charge, God, and then God gave the overseer, the under-shepherd, that responsibility to hear from him and then lead that ministry in that direction. Um, <clears throat> recently, I gave a five-minute message uh, from Rawls Tuesday morning um, meeting to the guys, and it was from another pastor who their elders decided that the pastor wasn't capable of leading the church. And they felt that the church should be governed more by a group of elders and they should make the decisions because in a multitude of counselors there's wisdom and so forth and this was their philosophy. And, that, and that's fine. They just need to go start their own church and not do it under someone else's authority. And it was such a struggle uh, for this pastor. I know this pastor and he's just such a, a very meek person. Even in his speaking, he's very meek, the way he, he teaches. And finally, he had to tell them to leave. Tell them to leave. Church is always a struggle. And it'll always be a struggle. Because people take control of the church thinking that it's their church. And what we need to do is rest in the fact that it is God's church. From experience, I have learned that people will come and they will push their opinions. They will want their ways. And eventually, they're going to leave and I'm still going to be here. And I have to be faithful to what God is doing because it's His church. Another pastor uh, was sharing a little five-minute message. And he was, he was saying that uh, he followed a bunch of other pastors and how the Lord was blessing them. But he was saying, I wish I could have a good story like that and say that the Lord's blessing our church. But uh, let me say this. He's, it's what he said. Uh, we went from 35 people to 13 people. <laughs> he goes, that's my ministry right there in Pomona. He said, that's the ministry that God's called me to. And of those 13 people, you know, we hope my wife and my kids are there, <laughs> you know, the 13 people. But then his point was, is that it's not about the size of the church. It's not about uh, the people that are going there, the commitment there. It's about your faithfulness to your calling. Are you faithful to what God has called you to do, whether there's 60 people or 13 people? See, it's about you personally with God, just as it is with the body and with the Lord. Those struggles are a part of the church. It's really not our church. It's God's church. And if God allows people to come in and out like that, that's his prerogative. I have to learn through all those things. Leadership has to learn through those things that these things will happen. You know, my speech isn't always the best. 
I don't always have the right words and I mispronounce words as I'm reading sometimes because they're very difficult for me to read them. But that's who I am. I, I can't change that. I can study, I can practice, and believe me, I, I literally practice those words. I put in parentheses the way it sounds out and sometimes I still don't get it right. And so I do the best that I can and I leave the rest to the Lord. But people have a judgmental attitude because he can't pronounce that word. It's not a good church. Really? You know, that, that's the wrong attitude to have. You know, this is who God's called here to this place. You either support it and you trust in God or you don't. And you move on and you find a place that they can pronounce words a lot better than I can. You know, and, and I look out there and I see pastors who, like this young gentleman that was sharing about 35 to 13. He's, he's a very articulate person. And I'm thinking, well, I wish I could speak like him. And yet he's got 13, you know. But that's where God has him at that time to test his heart and his faithfulness. See, we need to trust that it's God's church and not our church. And so many times in the 19 years we've been here, God has been faithful to do things. Uh, me and Russ were just uh, looking outside this morning and I was telling him how all this stuff came about. You know, and, and it was just like, wow, the Lord took care of it all. He provided for it all. You know, and that's what God does when it's His church. I didn't have to do a thing for it, but just take steps of faith. So we can what? Rest in Him. We can rest in Him. And that's what He's talking about here. Now, <clears throat> the lofty city will, is humbled here in verse 5 through 6, for He brings down those who dwell on high. Uh, this is pride. The lofty city, He lays it low. He lays it low to the ground. He brings it down to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. So one day, God will tread down the ungodly. That is for sure. They're, they will not get away with it. They will stand in judgment before God, the Lord, because of their pride. And their pride, God will humble them. Um, <clears throat> It's always a scary feeling. I, I hear stories of people who were prideful and then they're humbled by the Lord or by situations. I think of that little story that, that someone told years ago about the pastor who, who felt like um, his message was so good that he couldn't wait to share it with the body. And so he walked up to the, to the pulpit and he was like standing like this and he presented it and so forth. And he thought, wow, that was the best thing. And as he walked down, he tripped and he fell down on the floor. And someone came up to him and said, if you would have went up that way instead of coming down that way, your message would have been that much better. Because of pride. Thinking that you have it. I got it. This is the greatest message ever. And then you fall down on the way out. You know, And so God has a way of humbling you when you think that you're good. you know, And then something happens. And he will humble the, the wicked. Now the way of the righteous. The way of the just is unrighteousness. <clears throat> O oh, most upright, <clears throat> you weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgment, O oh Lord, we have waited for you. You desire our souls is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul, I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So the way of the just is unrighteousness. Um, they think they're just, is what it's saying here. It's not that they are just, but they think they're doing the right thing, but yet it's unrighteousness. It's, it's that they, what is good is called evil, and what is evil is called good. And they think they're, they're going, doing a good thing, and but... It's really unrighteousness. They think it's a good thing to give women the right to make a choice because it's their body. They think that's a good thing because it liberates the woman. It gives them the freedom. It gives them power and so forth. But in the sense, it's evil in God's eyes because you are murdering a child if you have an abortion. And so, um, though they think they're just and they're righteous, they're really unrighteous. So the way of the wicked, look at verse 10. Let let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In other words, uh, you can talk to your blue in the face, and yet they're not going to listen to you. They just won't listen to you. Uh, it's amazing. Um, uh, on Facebook, I've been trying to share with s some of Virginia's family. Virginia's family is, 
is very intelligent. Uh, a lot of them are doctors, lawyers. Some of them are doctors and lawyers at the same time. Very intelligent people, engineers, own, own businesses and so forth. And their children are the same way. And then just recently I, I posted a, a comment about the world coming to an end. I think I shared it on Sunday. And so now there's this little debate going back between me and this, uh, this individual. And, and they are so hard to reach because they're set in their mind, their intellects, uh, they believe in evolution. They believe in all the atheistic uh, garbage that's out there. And then yet, you see that and you go, how can you ever reach them? You, you, you talk to your blue in the face. You give them evidence. And as soon as you give them the evidence, they don't even respond to the evidence. They just move on to another accusation without even responding to what you just said because they know they don't have an answer. And yet... I find this interesting. In this little church, we have a very educated person that has started coming here who was an atheist. And God put them in a situation where he opened up their eyes to the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And they have given their lives to the Lord. An atheist. And I, I have not seen that you know, really personally myself or had known an atheist to really turn around and go the opposite. I know there are some, and I'm not saying we're the only ones. What I'm saying is that God is working, even in those that are so hard-hearted that we sometimes talk to we're blue in the face, and yet God softens the hearts of even those that he knows are called. That he's chosen before the foundations of the earth. But yet there are those that won't learn righteousness. In the land of the upright, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they will see and be ashamed for their envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. So here's a prayer of a humble heart. Verse 12, Lord, this is a prayer. Lord, will you establish peace for us? For you have also done all your works in us. O Lord, our God, Master, besides you have had dominion over us, but by you only we make mention of your name. They are dead. They will not live. They are deceased. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Now, he's not saying that he annihilated them, but that he you know, brought about their destruction. Not spiritually annihilation. Some take this scripture here and they'll say, uh-huh, uh huh, see, when God judges, there'll be total annihilation, no one will not exist. No, the Bible's clear that hell is real. You see that in Luke chapter 16, and it is eternal, and Satan will be cast down in that place. You have increased the nation. Increase the nation, O Lord, you have increased the nation. You have glorified, you have expanded all the borders of the land. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. Isn't that always the case? You know, when we're in trouble, then we start praying. And when we need the Lord's help, then we start calling upon him, unless you're so prideful that you don't call upon him. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. So when Israel is prospering, they turn their back on God is what they're doing here. Uh, though we know you're there, though we know you're real, though we know our ancestry, though we know that you're capable, yet we decide to not come to you. We decided to do our own thing, to go our own way. And yet, even though they're able to call upon God, they don't call upon Him. And when Israel is not, they call out for God's help, you know, as usual. The promise of the resurrection, look at verse 19. This is such a neat, neat verse right here that, um, that Isaiah brings about. Now, remember this. Isaiah is an interesting book. Uh, the first 39 chapters is dealing with um, Israel. The, the next 27 chapters is dealing with Jesus and his grace. The first 39 is dealing with the law. Now, what else in scripture does that? We have how many Old Testament books? 39. And it's dealing with the law. 
and Israel. How many New Testament books do we have? 27, and it's dealing with Jesus and grace to the Gentiles. And so you have this correlation in Isaiah to the whole book of God, the whole Old and New Testament together. And Isaiah deals with Israel and the law, then he also deals with God's judgment according to the law and God's judgment according to grace, and then God's judgment coming at the end in Revelation that we see. Now we see this inserted here concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your dead shall live. That's a promise. That's a promise that Isaiah gives from the Lord to the children of Israel. Your dead shall live. They will resurrect from the dead. Uh, Together with my dead body, they shall rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So when we die... When these bodies are buried in the ground or if we decide to cremate these bodies or if we're in war and our body parts are everywhere, however we die, when God comes back for us, the dead in Christ will first rise. Our bodies will come back together. Even if our bodies are scattered all over the world, God is big enough to bring all our bodies back together and then to reunite them with our soul. And our bodies will resurrect with our soul and will dwell with the Lord. Those that are alive on the earth will not have to go through the resurrection, but their bodies will put on a new body in a twinkling of an eye. They'll have that new body of Jesus Christ, like His. And so they'll arise like Jesus who had a body. He told the disciples, touch my hands, feel the, feel the uh, hole in my side, you know, uh, give me something to eat. And so... It's an example for us. We too will have these new bodies that we'll be able to eat. We'll be able to have flesh and bones of, of some sort, but not uh, wickedness. It'll be mortal bodies, uh, transformed bodies, uh, different types of bodies. The resurrected bodies that God's promised to us uh, there. Now a promise of refuge. Come my people, enter my chambers. I love that. A, an invitation to enter into the chambers of God in that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. It was a wonderful week last week, just just um, waiting on the Lord, just praising Him and, and really entering into His chambers. It was beautiful. Um, I'm just excited about that. In fact, the, the whole process of, of waiting on the Lord and things is, was just a, a refreshing time for us. And God loves that. He loves it when we come to Him and sit at His feet. And shut your door behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So a a reference to Revelation chapter 4, when God's wrath will be poured upon the world in that last three and a half years. And during that time, wrath will be poured upon the people of this world. Okay, chapter 27. We see a continuation here and a picture of what will happen to Satan, that beast that's cast into the sea, and how God will judge him and defeat him. Look at verse 1. In that day the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. So a reference to Satan there. He's Leviathan, that twisted serpent. We know that he rebelled against God. Isaiah will talk, talked about it back in chapter 14, I believe it is. And God cast him to the earth. And he presented himself to Eve as a serpent, deceived her. Uh, And then Adam was deceived by Eve. And then they ate of the fruit and sin entered into the world. And Satan has been causing havoc throughout the world ever since. Um, And the demonic forces that are with him. You know, the new Noah movie that just came out. um, Boy, is it unbiblical. (laughs) Uh, There's hardly any... Any biblical truth there except for the fact that water came into the earth and flooded. That's probably the only thing that's really biblical in the name Noah. You know, but in that movie they had these rock, rock angels that were protecting Noah, which is not even in scripture at all. And these angels apparently were, were cast to the earth. And Isaiah does talk about, about Satan being cast to the earth before man was created. And that he literally, some suggest that he hid under the rocks. 
and waited. And then when God created man, then he slithered and, and deceived them. Now, maybe he's taking it from that idea. I'm not sure. But these angels were indwelling these rock creatures that were protecting Noah and just wiping out people all over the place who were attacking the, the ark. And then when they died, when they were exhausted, their, the rocks kind of came apart and their beings went back up into heaven. Now, those, those are the angels that were fallen. And the scripture says they're not going back to heaven. They're going to be judged. Before God, that's what the Bible says, along with Satan on that uh, day when the pit is opened up and God casts him down to the earth. So, in that day, sing to her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it, I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Furry is not in me, or fury is not in me, who would set barriers and thorns against me in battle. I would go through them, I would burn them together, or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bloom and fill the face of the earth with fruit. Again, Isaiah is speaking to Israel at this time. He's speaking about the vineyard. This is the representation of Israel themselves. And one day God will take them and regather them uh, into himself. Now we see that they have been regathered into the nation Israel. And they're dwelling there in Israel today. But there will be a time where Israel will come into the Lord's bosom. The greatest revival will take place during the tribulation period. Some think that we'll have a revival before the tribulation begins. And we may. You just never know. But the greatest revival will be during the tribulation period when God anoints the Israelites to be witnesses for him. And they go out and the children of Israel are returning back to the Lord's bosom. And that will be the great revival. That will be an exciting time when the Spirit of God moves in such a a mighty and massive way that God's chosen people, Israel, will be reunited as a wife to the Lord. So he's speaking here to Israel. Now, in the kingdom of the Lord, Israel will receive mercy. Has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? In measure, by sending it away, you contended with it. He removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. So again, God's mercy towards Israel. He has a love for them. And mercy is available to them. Yet the fortified cities will be desolate. The habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed and there it will lie down uh, and consume its branches. When its broth are withered, they will be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire. Uh, For it is a people of no understanding. Therefore he who made them will not have mercy on them. And he who formed them will show them no favor. So the city will be uh, laid desolate by the Lord. And then uh, we see in the kingdom age that he will be worshipped there in Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in that day. So again, in that day, and you can highlight that when Isaiah uses in that day, speaking of the future time, that the Lord will thresh from the channels of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. Again, that, that thought of God bringing his people back to himself. So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of this Syria. And they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. So again, Israel will be reunited. And that speaks about restoration, forgiveness, uh, repentance, <clears throat> and so forth uh, to the children of Israel and also for us. If we fall away from the Lord, there's always mercies, there's always forgiveness, but there has to come repentance also on our part. An acknowledgement that we have 
you know, sinned against the Lord and we desire to be restored with the Lord. And you know what's so interesting I have experienced is that God is always willing to take us back. He never stops. I've met people who have been away from the Lord for years, if not 10 years or more, and have decided that it was enough. They need to come back to the Lord. And the Lord opens His arms up and and restores them in, in great ways. And so that's always available to us. And we should know that and understand that. It's important for us to know that God is a merciful God and a loving and caring God, and especially a forgiving God and a forgetful God. He's forgetful. Because he forgets our sins. And he remembers them no more. I'm not saying he's forgetful and that he forgets we're here or we're around. Sometimes we feel like that, right? Where are you, God? Why am I going through this? You know, are, are you busy somewhere else, you know, that you're forgetting about me? And it's kind of like Noah. There's a part in the scriptures that it says that, that God repented and remembered Noah. It's not that he forgot about him. It says that his, his time wasn't ready yet. And so uh, God always remembers us. Now we come to a chapter, chapter 28, and we, we talk about the northern kingdom, Ephraim, and they're, they're pretty much wasted, man. <laughs> These guys are into pride and drunkenness and partying and as though nothing's going on in the world. We see that today, not just in Christians who know the Lord, and yet they don't feel like they have to prepare for anything. You know, the preterists, the preterists are, are, are kind of like this in the in not necessarily they're drunkards or anything, but in the fact that there's nothing to worry about as far as God's judgment, the tribulation coming, and all those things, because the preterist doesn't believe uh, that we're going to go through a tribulation. They believe it already happened that we're living through in the millennium age, and so for them, they're not living as though the judgment is coming. It's already came, and that's sad, and that's the state of the. Ephraimites here is they're living as though judgment is coming, though they know judgment is coming, they know that they're sinful, they know they should repent, and yet they don't. They just drink and party and try to enjoy themselves before any of it happens. Kind of that attitude of, let's wait till it gets close and then we'll deal with it, you know? Let's just enjoy ourselves now. A lot of us have that attitude. Well, I, I can serve and I'll serve, but, but I'll wait a little bit. Let me enjoy myself first and then let me serve, you know? And they think they have enough time. Uh, to do so, and we don't, and, and that's not how God wants us to live our lives either. He wants us to be involved now. He wants us to be active now, not with the world, but with the Lord's kingdom. Throughout scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, God has made it clear that He wants us to be servants He wants us to be light and salt in the New Testament. He wants us to be an example to the world through Israel, through the other nations to bring judgment upon them. He's always wanted his people to be different than the world. His people are not to sit in chairs and do nothing. They are to be active in the kingdom of God. And that means whether they're sharing their their testimonies and, and offering salvation to others, Uh, or they're involved in ministry in churches, or whether they're helps at times when there's needed help, whether they're supporting the church, God has always wanted us to be active in the ministry. Because everything is ministry, and it's all for the glory of God. He has not called us as believers to sit and do nothing. That's not what He's called us to do. That's unscriptural. In fact, it's unnatural to do that. There's something wrong with your salvation in your relationship with God when you do that. He wants us busy serving Him in one capacity or another. He says to Ephraim, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glory, beauty is fading flowers, which is at hand of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, that is the Assyrians, Uh, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. So because of their pride, because of their drunkenness, God is going to raise up the Assyrians and they will judge the northern kingdom. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And the glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of the verdant valley. Like the first fruit before the summer, which an overseer sees, he eats it up while it is still in his hand. The pride was to 
be taken away by the Assyrians in God's hand. When you read about strong drink, alcohol, drunkenness, it's always in a negative way in scriptures. I know the Bible says not to be drunk, drunk and that it is a sin. And I know that we have liberties to drink, but I think we need to drink at home. Otherwise, we cause others to stumble. Um, it is your responsibility. You are a watchman, Ezekiel chapter 3, 33. And you're to be watching other people watching you if you're having a drink and you're out somewhere or you're posting it on Facebook that you got a margarita. and so forth. That's stumbling people and that's sin. And you need to be careful of that. And it's so strange that, that the church is kind of pushing towards that now, that even pastors are talking about having drinks and smoking cigars and, and, and doing those vices that are destructive to the temple of God, yet alone destructive to the body of Christ. We shouldn't be doing those things. And God is judging their drunkenness because they're into wine. You know, These are the guys that say, oh, I can have a little drink. There's no big deal. God still loves me. God still cares about me. I'm a Christian. I have liberties. Don't be under the law. Don't be under the law. Don't, don't judge me. You know, they use all those words because it justifies them. And, and unfortunately, it doesn't. Because they're causing others to sin. And then they're also drinking. Believe me. You start down that path of having a cup of wine at dinner and then at night, then with friends. And so Eventually, it leads down to more and more and more because sin brings forth death. And you can't just stop at one. Eventually, you will have more than one. And it's sad. You have worship leaders that are drinking, and they're presenting the worship and the singing, and we're bringing us into the kingdom of God. And yet, on the side, they're over there drinking with people. You know, And how can they worship? How can they do that when they're doing that at the same time? You can't. You just can't. And so we need to be careful that we're not misusing scriptures to justify you know, our drunkenness. First of all, what is drunk? By whose laws? God's laws or man's laws? Is it, you know, it used to be what, point, point one something? Now it's point oh eight, you know? And so, well, maybe it's point oh five with God. Maybe it's point oh one with God, you know? How far are you, how far does it take for you to be intoxicated? Uh, back in the days, BC, before Christ, you know, I could drink a case of beer. That's 12 cans of beer. And I was intoxicated by that time, but I could drink a whole case of beer by myself. Now, my wife, you give her one. At that time, they used to sell what, what they called them, wine coolers. I don't know if they still sell those or not. I'm talking years ago. They called them wine coolers. You give her a half a wine cooler, she's gone. She's like loca, crazy girl, you know, with, with that much in her. And so she never really drank. You know, the only time she drank was because I said, have a wine cooler, you know, and get loca, you know, that type of thing. But, but, Where's that line? Only God knows. But why, why even challenge it? Why, why say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to .001. You know, if you think .01 is the line, then I'm going to go to .001, you know. And that's sad because that's pride and you're just pushing God. You're just pushing God. Now, you might think um, I'm legalistic and then I'm throwing a law out there that isn't really there. You need to be careful. No, I think you need to be careful. I'm not saying you can't have a drink once in a while in, in your own home and you feel like you want to drink, you know, then, then go ahead. Uh, if you're in ministry, if you're a pastor especially, I don't think you should be drinking at all. That's a covenant that we make to the Lord not to drink. So God's going to judge their, their folly, basically. In that day, again, speaking in the future, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of His people. For the spirit of Jess to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So in that day, uh, the Lord of hosts will be the crown of glory. I uh, can't wait for that day. But the uh, corruption and drunkenness for Judah. Look at verse 7. And they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophets have erred through intoxicating drink, and they are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. It gets descriptive. No place 
is clean. So you get this idea of them really being intoxicated. Even the priest, those who were leading the people, how can you lead the people when you're drunk? How can you lead the people uh, when you have no vision and no, no clarity? You can't because you're drunk with intoxicating drink. I remember a story years ago that there was a, a preacher and he was pretty good and God was using him, but he struggled with alcohol. He had a problem with, I think it was vodka, if I remember correctly. And he used to get drunk. And he'd oftentimes teach the message and then afterwards go and, go and get drink. When I was in the Catholic religion, I would hear all the stories, gossip, about which priests had wine problems. You know, and they would be drunk most of the time. And they would perform their duties. How can you do that? You can't. God's going to judge them. When or whom will he teach knowledge? And whom... Will he make to understand the message who's just warning or weaned from milk, who just dawned from the breast? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's Calvary's philosophy right there, right? <clears throat> I mean, if you're drunk, you can't do that. You can't teach book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You know, so line upon line. And God is saying basically here, you should be able to teach that. You should be able to get into the word of God. And you should be able to look at every single word that God is speaking and understand what that verse and that scripture is saying there. And you should be able to present that to peoples with clarity and not in your drunkenness. I believe it was Aaron's sons that brought strange fire before the altar, right? Because they were intoxicated and the Lord judged them for that. For with <clears throat> stimmering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. Now this is an interesting verse here. Because you would think, for with stimmering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. He's speaking about God here. Not the people being drunk that they can't speak. He throws this in, on this judgment, this verse. And it's kind of strange because it's a reference to the gifts of tongues in the New Testament. Well, how do we know that? Again, for with stimmering lips and another tongue he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. When you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21, Paul quotes this verse. And he's quoting it in context of the gift of tongues. There's a gift of tongues that is out there. Now, contrary to what John MacArthur says, that there are no gifts of tongues, there are no miracles, there are no prophecies, those were done away with, you know. Of course, the gift of teaching wasn't, because that's what he does, is he teaches. And so he's got to make sure to keep his gift there, you know. And so, the Bible says there is a gift of tongues, and it is available to us. I have the gift of tongues, we need to seek out that gift, though. One of Calvary's philosophies earlier on was the gifts of the Spirit. But we weren't Pentecostal in the sense of an extreme Pentecostal. We tried to find the balance between the very conservative and the very Pentecostal and find the balance of what Scripture said. And so what I loved about Calvary Chapel is that they taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse, precept by precept, line upon line. Just what the Bible said, and let's do what the Bible says, let's believe what the Bible says, and let's keep it that way, and then we'll be in order, and we'll be fine. Where people go out of hand, for instance, have you ever been to a church that speaks in tongues, and everybody's speaking in tongues? I have. I've been in a church that had probably about 2,000 people, and then all of a sudden the pastor gets up there, and he starts speaking in tongues. Then the whole church stands up, and they're all speaking in tongues. It's strange. It's weird. It's weird. Uh, to even hear that, that's unscriptural. Now, I've been to afterglows with Calvary Chapel, and, and one person will get up and speak in tongues, and maybe another person will speak in tongues, and then all of a sudden, that's it. And then someone will give an interpretation of that tongue, or the other tongues, or they'll give a prophecy. And it's done decently, and it's in order, and it's interpreted, and everyone understands what's going on. That's biblically sound. And that's what Calvary philosophy is all about. I posted a recent interview with uh, Brian Brodison answering the strange fire of John MacArthur. And he said that we need to, as Calvary Chapel, get back to that. 
I really believe so. I am a very Pentecostal person, not in an extreme sense, but, but in a balanced sense. It's where I came from. I, I was saved at a time of, 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 of the end of a revival, in a sense, in a mightily way where God just took hold of my heart in a, in a, in a strong and mightily way. Um, and so the gifts were used at this time with Calvary Chapel. They had afterglows constantly. I remember one time, not being there, but I remember uh, reading that they had an afterglow and someone gave a number. It was just a telephone number. The Lord just gave them a telephone number. They spoke the telephone number. So, the, so Chuck decided, well, let's call it and see what happens. It turned out to be a number to China, communist China. And this person that was on the other line started to talk with Chuck and they made arrangements for Chuck to go down there and share the gospel. Stuff like that happened. Now, how does that happen? It's a move of the Spirit of God. Yeah. Uh, another instance with, with, with Chuck was that, I believe it was Kay, uh, spoke in tongues, and someone who just happened to be visiting the church, who was a teacher of language, um, and I can't remember the language at this time, but she was able to interpret the language. She came up afterward and said, where did you learn how to speak that? Because that really isn't spoken anymore. It's an archaic language, and yet you spoke it exactly the way it should. And so she explained to her, I don't speak it. It was, it was the gift of tongues. The Lord gave it to me, and it was just for you, so that you could hear it, so that you could know that there is a God, and that he's able to do these signs. And she ended up accepting the Lord. Yeah, like that. Um, these gifts are available to us. Um, I know I've had struggle here in the church. When I brought in afterglows, oh, we shouldn't do this. People don't understand it. It might scare them away. You know what? We need to get them to understand it. We need to help them to understand there's more beyond just the humanistic power and strength, that there are spiritual divine gifts that God has given to us to use for His glory. You know, um, Brian was kind of sharing that on Sunday nights they're going to start implementing some of these gifts again that they used to have uh, during the time of the tent revival and, and so forth. Um, I, I can't emphasize that more. We really need to use the gifts of God more, the spiritual gifts. Uh, I have the gifts of tongues. I have the gifts of prophecy. Um, I have literally sensed the Spirit of God anoint me in, in such a fresh way uh, that I know God is real and no one will ever take that away from me. Uh, I've only read of two other people that have done that. Pastor Chuck was one of them. And then D.L. Moody, I shared with you on Sunday, where two women kept hounding him about being anointed by the Holy Spirit. He just kind of like, ah, I don't need that, I don't need that. Grun grun uh, grumpy old man, you know. But then once he accepted it, boom, he was like on fire for the Lord, a fresh anointing of the Spirit of God. And I know that sensation. And I wanted that sensation uh, when I first got saved. I wanted everything God had. And I literally sought the Lord every single day. I want the gift of tongues. I want that gift, Lord. And I'm not going to stop until you give me that gift. We don't do that anymore. We just say, Lord, can you give me that gift? Oh, okay, no. And then you go on. <laughs> you know, God wants us to be persistent. And I was persistent. And on my way to a church uh, to get equipped... I spoke in tongues, you know, and then I wanted to just sense the Lord. I'm like, I'm not stopping, Lord. You, you just, I want to know your love. I want to feel your love. And so I just kept praying, singing. I want to feel that every day, every day, every day, every day. And it took months, sometimes years. And all of a sudden, one day, the Lord just whoo, anointed me with the Spirit, and I sensed His love. And it was so beautiful. I don't know how to describe it. It, it was a sensation you know how sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll watch someone's life, uh, maybe uh, a death of their child, and they start speaking and your heart starts to ache? You know how you ever get that achy feeling in your heart? It's kind of like that, but it's like a hundred times harder than that, where you're going, Lord, this is awesome, this is great, and then he just keeps pouring it, and then finally he's like, Lord, okay, you need to stop now, because now I'm about ready to have a heart attack, because it hurts that much, and then... And it's like, Lord, please, could you stop? And then all of a sudden, boom, it just stops like that. I'm like, what is that? And I remember him saying to me, not in an audible voice, but just in my mind, that's just a little bit of how much I love you. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. Because in it's an experience of the gifts that God has for us. And so here in this scripture, Isaiah talks about the gift of tongues. And it's available to us. I encourage you to, to, to pray to the Lord. And to ask for that gift, for all the gifts, whatever gifts that God wants you to have because they're available to you. 
Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, verse 14, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we are in agreement. Um, When the overflowing surge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood, we have hidden ourselves. So what they're saying here is, oh, no, nothing's going to happen to us. We made a deal with the devil, and uh, we're, we'll be fine. We're going to continue partying, drunk, and, and, and all of that stuff. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Now, he's speaking of Jesus Christ there, right? The sure cornerstone for us that we can fall upon. Not that he would fall upon us, but here he will fall upon them because of their pride. Also, I will make just the measuring line and righteousness, the plummet, the hail will sweep away uh, the refuge of lies and the water will overflow the hidden places. Your covenant with uh, death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand when the overflowing surge passes through, when you will be trampled down by it as Often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass over you. And by day and by night, it will be a terror just to understand the report. So God is saying, I don't care if you made a deal with the devil. (laughs) My judgment's coming and you will experience it. No getting around that. For the bed is too short to stretch out on. And the covering uh, so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it. For the Lord will rise up at the Mount of Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work, his awesome work and bring to pass his acts, his unusual acts. Whose work is it? His work. And it's an awesome work. And God is faithful to keep his promises, even his judgments. Now, therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Again, speaking of the tribulation period when God's judgment will come upon the whole earth. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Do not the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods, clods, dirt clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cinnamon and scatter the cinnamon uh, plants and wheat and rolls and barley in the appointed places and the split in its place, for he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him, for the back, black sinum is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel rolled over the sinum. But the black sinum is beaten out with a stick and the sinum with a rod. Bread, flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever, break it with a cartwheel or crush it with a his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. So here, just the, the timing of the farmer and the timing of God. So just like the timing of a father who plants everything and does everything to a perfect tea and then he gets his crops, so God's judgment is coming exactly like that. I think we'll stop right there. We don't have enough time to hit two more chapters. You know, it's hard to be encouraged in Isaiah because you see God's judgment coming upon their stubbornness. And then you look at the United States and you go, wow, Lord, what's coming? What's coming for the world? What's coming for uh, those false religions that mislead people or those pastors who misrepresent God, the judgment that's coming? Or those Christians who who profess to be Christians and yet their lives contradict God's word. And they're really not. The judgment that's coming upon them all. And God's judgment is true. He's coming. And He is judging. And He will judge us all. And we will all stand before Him. And so we need to make sure that our hearts are right. Because if our hearts are right and we humble ourselves before Him, He promises promises that He will have mercy and forgiveness for us. That's the God that we serve. And so yet at the same time, you look at the world, but yet you see what's available to us if we're willing to humble ourselves. I encourage you to 
it's like a an animal who's been neglected. You, you, you buy this beautiful little dog, or in my case, a pig, <laughs> you know, and you, <laughs> and Virginia raises it and loves it, and she just loves this thing to death, you know, holds it and carries and feeds it like with a bottle and everything, and is, rubs its big, ugly nose, you know, and, and just, just loves it. But can you imagine, and it's happened where, where all of a sudden you get bored and you leave it alone and now it's just sitting in the back of a corner doing nothing. You throw some food out there real quick and you, you, you're off and running and you, know, you don't even think about it anymore. And sometimes you forget, oh, I've got to go feed the pig and it's been out there for days now and, and so forth. And sometimes as Christians we do that. You know, we, we get bored, we, we forget what we're here for or, or things get in the way, we get busy. And yet, all of a sudden... We can have this newfound love for the pig. You know, it's like, I remember when that little thing was small, when it ran around and, and so forth. And you go out there and you start to love it again. You start to feed it. You allow it to come back into the house. It's sleeping in its own little bed, making its little, little snorry nose, going on its belly, sticking up like this, saying, scrub me, scrub me, scrub me, you know, type of thing. And you fall in love again and you start taking care of it again. And then it has little piglets and then you're even more in love with it. You know, and that's where we need to be. We need to restore that first love that God has given to us. You know, where did you lose it? Go back and find that first love in the Lord and, and see what He does when you're available to Him.